you've given a student presentation a few years ago, and now I have more time to tell you about the work we're doing. Uh, before I go into the details, uh, I think I should tell you a little bit about cancer uh, genomics and the background of why we want to look for driver mutations. So uh, this has to do with cancer genetics. Genetics is the inheritance of uh, uh, genetic material from parents to children, and then they have uh, their related phenotypes. So an example of that would be your shirt uh, and stripes. So you could have uh, horizontal stripes and vertical stripes, and maybe the outcome is an additive effect of a checkered shirt. So this is uh, how uh, information gets passed on from parents to children. In cancer, it's, uh, it's definitely different. Cancer is not inherited from your parents uh, to children. Uh, the only thing that could be inherited is cancer risk. Cancer is a genetic disease, but it's not uh, genetic in the sense of being inherited. Uh, it is caused by somatic mutations in cells uh, over the person's lifetime. So here is uh, an often used figure in order to illustrate how cancer evolves. Uh, we believe that cancer starts from a single cell. And we have many different cells in our organism. All of them uh, are exposed to mutations. And those mutations uh, more or less acquire random, are acquired randomly into different areas of the genome. And uh, by far, most of those mutations, we believe, are harmless. So they don't do anything much to the cells, and the cells survive and pass on these mutations uh, to the next generation of cells. However, a small minority of mutations uh, are known to be very harmful because they affect important genes in, the, um, in, in those cells. Um, and therefore, they will change the cells dramatically. So these uh, mutations are called driver mutations. And driver mutations, uh, as, as those uh, the opposite would be passenger mutations, they uh, accumulate over time in different cells. And because we have so many cells, uh, and all of them acquire their own mutations, it's likely that at some point that there will be a cancerous cell. Uh, the probability of accumulating these mutations is increased by various carcinogens, such as uh, cigarette smoke or UV light from the sun, but also uh, various heterogeneous processes of DNA damage repair, some of which will be increased uh, by uh, inheritance uh, from uh, your parents. And uh, in this figure, we have time from left to right, and a single cell accumulating some of those mutations. Many of them will be harmless, but some of them, or driver mutations, will affect important cellular properties that will lead to growth of those cells relative to other cells, and those mutations then are positively selected. And very often, some of those initiating tumor mutations, uh, they will affect either cell growth, so making those cells uh, grow more, more rapidly, or uh, apoptotic cell uh, death pathways, which will stop those cells from dying. And, uh, uh, say we have an initiating driver mutation leading to more and more growth. At some point, because the cells uh, still ac accumulate more and more mutations, uh, another mutation would occur, which would uh, lead to additional protein properties. At that point, there will be more types of cells within the tumor that keep on growing and complementing each other. <coughs> so it, it becomes a multi-clonal uh, population of cells, uh, and that becomes ever more complex. There are many different genomes in these tumors. And then that particular line over here represents uh, uh, tumor therapy, which will kill some of the cells, but not all of them. Um, and then some of those additional cell, cell populations will start to grow. Occasionally, some of them acquire metastatic properties, which has to do with increased mobility uh, and so on. So those tumors may find a way to another distal organ uh, to initiate a new tumor there. Um, why do these um, events occur? We know that these mutations affect critical cells, but we don't know what critical pathways, but we don't know what they are. Uh, mostly they have to do with growth, um, various uh, increasing growth mutations or those mutations that stop uh, the blocks of growth, uh, or they have to do with resisting cell death. Uh, perhaps there's also some genome instability mutations involved that lead to ever, ever more mutations, and then cellular energy. Uh, such as also angiogenesis that enables more nutrients to be passed on to tumors, and so on. So these pathways or properties are called the hallmarks of cancer, and the driver mutations that enable those hallmarks of cancer are the mutations that we're after. So somatic mutations um, drive cancer, and they give cells these uh, supervillain powers that give mortality and growth, and they do such uh, by um, activating oncogenes, so genes that normally should be suppressed, and also by inhibiting tumor suppressors, so protective genes that should normally be activated in tumor cells. So there are these two, two kinds of uh, major, um, major mechanisms that we believe are acting on tumor uh, genomes or tumor phenotypes. 
how do we find driver mutations? We need a lot of data. We need a lot of data out from genome sequencing, from independent patients, because these driver mutations are known to be positively selective. So they, are, they occur independently uh, much more often than we would expect by chance. And then there are these different algorithms, driver discovery tools that use various properties. So mutation frequency, mutation clustering upon the genome or upon genes, a function of the mutations, and different uh, approaches to find those driver genes in, in large databases and uh, cancer genomes. Uh, before going into how those driver genes are detected, we really need to understand what the data are. And so cancer genome sequencing uh, is the technology that allows us to detect driver genes and other uh, genetic alterations. Uh, and just to give a little bit of detail here, uh, in order to do this cancer genome uh, characterization, we need two biopsies. One of them would be a tumor biopsy, another one would be a match control, normally this is uh, patient blood. And this is required because by only sequencing the tumor genome, we get a mix of variation. It's the inherited variation from the patient, but also uh, the additional variation that exists in the tumor genome. Uh, so we use a DNA sequencer. Uh, we align um, detected uh, reads to the human genome. We call the variance, so the differences between uh, the tumor genome and the, um, and the reference human genome. And then we do some quality control steps. So the first sample without, will give us somatic variation, the germline variation. Um, the second sample will give us only the blood variation. We expect that that's uniform. And then we subtract uh, B from A to give tumor specific variation. So this is uh, the, the genetic material that only occurs in the tumor but not in, uh, in the patient itself. Uh, so the first experiments uh, that are now more than, uh, than 10 years old of uh, sequencing tumor exomes, so uh, the part of the DNA that encodes the proteins, uh, revealed this landscape of uh, mountains and hills. So what you see here is um, genes being ordered from the first chromosome to all the way to the, uh, the X and Y chromosomes. And uh, those peaks show how many times those genes were mutated in a cohort of colon cancer patients. So you see immediately that there is a pretty flat landscape, but in addition there are these immediate peaks and then uh, a lot of these small hills. Um, and when, when you look at a couple of individual tumor genomes or exomes in this case, you see that uh, uh, there is a lot of random scattering of mutations, gray ones and yellow ones, but there is also a few of those dark blue spots, and these are cancer genes that are accumulating mutations in both of the patients. So we can see the mutation recurrence or the mutation positive selection here that's uh, important to understand in order to detect cancer driver genes. So as I told you uh, just a few minutes ago, those driver genes could be oncogenes and they could be tumor suppressors. Oncogenes get activated, tumor suppressor genes get uh, inactivated through those mutations uh, and therefore uh, there we see these different curious patterns of mutations. Oncogenes tend to accumulate mutations into particular spots on those proteins, um, and then oftentimes you can think about it that, that maybe this is a gun or a weapon, and then at that point here is the trigger of that weapon. So the mutations will currently activate the protein, uh, and that leads to tumor genesis. Uh, tumor suppressors, on the other hand, accumulate all these uh, mutations that are more evenly distributed, and many of them are truncating mutations, so they cause an early stop codon, and therefore the protein get, is a, short, a shorter protein is translated. And uh, you can think about that as many different ways of breaking down an existing system. So there are many ways of breaking down a tumor suppressor gene, a protective mechanism. Um, the genome is a very large space, so therefore, if you, if you have only one mutation per patient, uh, and it recurs at exactly the same spot, it's statistically very unlikely. So the alternative hypothesis is that the, the recurrence of the mutation in the same gene or in, in, in the same uh, nucleotide or in the same pathway is statistically very unlikely, and therefore it maybe re represents positive selection that's required for tumor development. So how do we find driver genes using that knowledge? Well, the naive approach is the following. We have 20,000 genes in the human genome. Maybe we have 10 patients with precisely the same mutant gene and no other mutations. So what is the chance that all of those mutations are exactly in the same spot, just randomly? So 1 over 20,000 for a probability per gene, but all of those mutations to occur in 10 patients at the same time is a very small probability. So this is the very naive model. It makes a lot of uh, incorrect assumptions, such as you know all patients being uh, equally mutated, all genes being of equal length, 
um, and many other programs. So this is not really a viable approach, but we're getting uh, closer. Um, why do we actually want to seek for drivers? Uh, one is that we want to understand the basic biology of uh, cancer, the basic genetics of cancer. How does a single nucleotide variant in the tumor genome really lead to this infinite growth and uh, death of the patient, perhaps? The other aspect is biomarkers. Once we know a particular mutation that always occurs in a particular type of tumor, we may be able to predict uh, which tumor is it, uh, how well the patient will do, and how will the patient behave to uh, therapy. And once we know the mechanisms uh, and the biomarkers, we may be able to start developing drugs that maybe address this particular mutated form of an oncology or so on. And why is that a big challenge? Uh, there's a large amount of variables that go into driver discovery, but also they're inherently coming from either the technology, the sequencing technology, or the tumor biology. So, for example, we see a large number of somatic vari uh, variation among disease types. Uh, there are some tumors that are very frequently mutated and others that are less. Uh, somatic variation is not uniform across the genome, but there are areas that are more mutated and others that are less mutated. Uh, we need a lot of data from individual patients uh, to tumor genome sequencing in order to make uh, robust and highly powered predictions. And there are many types of unknowns that we still are learning about the basic genome biology, for example, or the different tumor types, histologies, and so on. So here are a couple of examples of these various challenges that go into the analysis of driver mutations in cancer genome. One of them is that uh, uh, they vary vastly in terms of how many mutations they will have. So this is log scale, the number of mutations per megabase, and it uh, starts from uh, either pediatric tumors, brain tumors that we just discussed, um, and the blood-based tumors that will have relatively few mutations. And on the other end of the spectrum, uh, there are mutation and there are tumor types like melanoma that say uh, you know involve involves exposed skin to UV light. They have a lot of mutations, uh, hundreds of thousands of times more mutations per per megabase. So you can't just put them all in the same bucket and analyze them at the same time because you would be biased towards one tumor type or than others. Another feature has less to do with tumor types, but perhaps has more to do with genome biology and involves some of those known unknowns and unknown unknowns, is how mutations are distributed across the genome. So there appear to be megabase scale correlations between the transcriptional activity in a particular region of the genome uh, or the replication activity in a particular region of the genome and how many mutations does that region have. So not all megabases or genes have been considered equal uh, because there are some uh, large-scale properties of the genome that allow more mutations or less mutations to occur. And then there are some of those famous so-called cancer genes that are actually not cancer genes say there are large families of olfactory receptors in the genome, and they tend to show up and poison various driver discovery screens because there are certain properties of the genome where these olfactory receptors are located. All right, uh, and then another feature of the genome is similar to the earlier one, but it's, um, I think it occurs at a much uh, smaller resolution. And so these things are called mutation signatures and processes it turns out that different nucleotides or trinucleotides are not born equal in terms of how much they attract mutations, so to say. And they oftentimes these trinucleotide mutation signatures have been associated to mutation processes as well. Uh, for example, signature one, which uh, uh, associates with many C to T mutations, uh, occurs in many cancer types, and it correlates with age of diagnosis. So the older a patient is, the more mutations of that kind will the patient have. Um, another one would be signature three, uh, that has to do with uh, BRCA1 or 2 mutations. Um, this is a particular tumor suppressor gene uh, where that is also inherited. Uh, mutations in it are inherited, and then uh, there's a lot of C2A, C2G, and C2C mutations, and it's mostly apparent in breast ovarian and pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. And another one would be signature 4. Uh, C2A mutations are more abundant than any others, and this occurs with lung and liver and head and neck cancers, and has to do with uh, with patient smoking, and then there's a biochemical mechanism why that would be the case. Uh, I think there's about 20 mutation signatures so far for single nucleotide variants, and there are other ones that are developed for copy number variants and so on. So these were some of the inherited, um, inherited uh, the, the programs of human driver discovery. Um, another aspect is that what do we know so far? Uh, by far, the largest amount of results about known cancer driver genes are coming from the group sequence. So 
there's about 300 frequently mutated cancer from an earlier TCJ study. I think the number is quite the same with the more recent TCJ studies. And almost all of them are uh, involved protein coding mutations, so those that change uh, the translated protein sequence. Um, but then you all know pretty well that in the human genome, there's only about 2% of protein coding sequence. So the rest is non coding sequence. A lot of repeat elements and more things like that, but also a lot of gene regulatory sequence. So 99% of the knowledge comes from 1% of the genome, so that, that feels kind of wrong. Um, there are a few non-coding cancer drivers. The most famous of them is the TURT promoter. There is a very highly frequent uh, mutation hotspot in the TURT uh, oncology. And that uh, promoter mutation creates a new transcription factor binding site, which attracts a, a particular transcription factor, which leads to high expression of that TURT oncology. And that TURT oncology is a telomerase, so it extends the telomere tails of DNA. So in conclusion, most of the driver genes that are known so far come from exome sequencing studies. So we were looking out to find these driver mutations because we were only sequencing exomes. There are some whole genome sequencing studies that can look at the whole genome, but in the vast majority of cases, they only bother with promoters and uh, non-coding RNAs, and they don't really look at the non-coding genome in general. So the search space is still limited to, say, 5 to 10% of the genome. So what would all these other regions do in the genome? So regions that are far away yet gene regulatory? Well, most of the times when I used to think about DNA, I thought that it's a, it's a really long word. It's just like starts from the left the edge and uh, ends at the right edge of the screen. It's really long, it doesn't fit anything. Well, no. It turns out that there's two meters of DNA wrapped into six micrometers of nucleus, so it must look like a hairball. Uh, so therefore, there must be a lot of uh, uh, contacts between the faraway regions of, um, of the genome. And then some of those uh, faraway contacts are called chromatin loops. And those chromatin loops are known to uh, bring into three-dimensional proximity uh, gene promoters involved in gene regulation. And this that enhances also uh, involved in gene regulation. So there are many faraway gene regulatory elements that control gene expression of genes that are not nearby those elements. So those chromatin loops uh, connect those elements uh, together. And now we have these uh, high throughput, uh, pretty expensive, but already quite doable <coughs> experiments called chromosome confirmation capture. The most uh, recent one of them is called high c but there are several earlier generations, 3C and 4C and 5C. And what they essentially do is using uh, sequencing technology, they determine which parts of the DNA are interacting with which other parts of the DNA. And those um, other parts may be uh, hundreds of kilobases or maybe megabases away. Um, then those data sets are usually visualized as those um, correlation matrices. So regions that are red uh, indicate regions of DNA that are frequently interacting with one another. And if there are those triangles with uh, dark red spots at the, at the top of the triangles, then these uh, parts of DNA would be connecting together in three-dimensional space. So that's my naive understanding of the data. So how can we wrap all that up in order to uh, discover non-coding driver mutations? Uh, to do that, we first developed uh, a method called Active Driver WGS, which is based on some earlier work, which was then called Active Driver. WGS means whole genome sequencing. So we do driver discovery using the entire genome sequence and the variations in it. Um, the method itself is not anything really complicated. It's based on a Poisson generalized linear regression uh, where we compute the background mutation rate in a particular genome region, and then ask whether a, a gene of interest has a higher muta mutation rate than we would expect from the background. So the background um, is indicated over here uh, on the screen. This is usually 100,000 uh, base pairs, so 100,000 nucleotides is the background sequence. The gene sits in the middle of that background sequence. We also include any non-gene elements, for example, interest. And this is a general framework because you can apply it for genes, but also promoters or long ago coding RNAs or any other type of element that you're interested in. As input, we count how many trinucleotides of each kind does the background sequence have or the gene. And also we count these uh, trinucleotide signatures, so which kinds of mutations are induced. Um, and then this is the way the model looks. We, fit, uh, we ask whether the mutations are distributed according to the Poisson model using the trinucleotide context and the mutations as the covariance. And then we ask whether the region of interest um, seems to have a different mutation rate, and that mutation rate is way higher than you would expect from the background. 
and that gives us a p-value for every gene because we use uh, the chi-square test at the end, and um, that gives us uh, a short list of regions, perhaps out of a larger cohort of regions that we test. So what did we check to do in order to discover non-coding driver elements? We looked at the ENCODE project that has uh, profiled uh, many, many different cell lines in many different transcription factors, and then the ENCODE dataset has about 4.5 million transcription factor binding sites, so regions of the genome that are bound by transcription factors in experimental assays. Uh, we did some filtering and clustering of these transcription factor binding sites, and ended up with uh, about 150,000 systematic modules, so groups of transcription factor binding sites, uh, ran them through our algorithm, and came up with this much shorter list of frequently muted regulatory elements, fMREs, which will recur throughout this presentation. Once we had them, it turned out that many of them were not nicely sitting in gene promoters, but they were further away in the non-coding uh, genome. We used these long-range chromatin interactions or chromatin loops from public data sets to find potential target genes. And once we had those target genes, the best functional evidence of the activity of these non-coding driver mutations would be, do they change gene expression? So we were able to do that in a few cases. So comparing mutated examples with non-mutated examples and seeing if there's a change in gene expression. Where do we get our data? Um, and this is the largest data set of this kind. Uh, this is uh, produced by the ICGC TCJ PCOG project. There's a lot of acronyms here. But essentially, it's the largest cohort of whole genome sequences. It combines about 35 different tumor types. Um, we, have, we are mostly interested in single nucleotide variants, uh, the somatic and intels. There's about 50 million of those. And we also have gene uh, copy number data, RNA sequencing data, some methylation data, and a subset of clinical data about those patients. Um, and then this comes from all over the world. This is a large consortium effort for, to which we have early access thanks to the protection of the ICR. Um, this is a very quick overview there are of the data set so far, there's a few uh, groups of uh, samples that come from individual tumor types that have more than 100 samples. The median uh, size is about 40 <coughs> samples, which is not a lot, but if you pull them all together, it becomes an interesting data set. Um, before going into the non-coding uh, analysis, we wanted to make sure that our driver discovery tool is doing the right thing. And where do you look for your keys on a dark parking lot? obviously under the lamp, so therefore we went to look uh, into the protein coding sequence to find driver genes. Um, and then this, this would, should tell you that our model is pretty accurate because uh, we found 47 genes, 90% of them are well enough in anti-gene census genes, so we're doing pretty well in the protein coding sequence, which should lend confidence to our driver discovery tools. Um, obviously, there are some uh, uh, false positives here. I talked about the old factor receptors here, so here's one. But, you know, most of those genes are in bold phase, meaning that they are confirmed cancer driver genes at least in their studies. Looking into the non-coding space, we found fewer results. This is 30 non-coding regions, uh, but they're almost entirely novel. Uh, there are three regions that have been uh, identified in earlier research. One of them is the third promoter, it's pretty high. And then there's MALAC1, which is a non-coding RNA. And then there's WDR74 promoter, which is more and more considered like a uh, mutation sequencing artifact. And then there are these other regions that are pretty interesting. Three of them associated with known cancer genes, genes versus um, genes. And then there are others where we don't really know what the target genes are, but we have a, we have a wild guess. Uh, then having run this first through our own tool, we tested a couple of other tools that, uh, uh, that are able to detect uh, driver genes or non-coding regions genome-wide. Uh, those tools are called uh, OncoDriver FML, Driver Power from the Science Lab, and NPR from Sanga. And it was encouraging to see that the majority of regions that we identified, so the 30, the majority of them were found by at least another tool. So this is very unlikely to happen by chance. Uh, then six out of the seven novel highlighted regions where we had good target genes were found by you know, most of those, or half of those tools. And then there's also a somewhat larger number of regions that are found by the superset of all of those tools, which means that different algorithms have different features and different um, strong points. So it's worth uh, exploring the non-coding genome with different algorithms, and obviously building new algorithms as well. OK. <clears throat> Another type of um, analysis was based on a custom permutation test where we wanted to see if 
uh, once we had our regions of interest, do they still seem to have more SMBs than expected if we start to sample uh, regulatory regions randomly from, from the genome? So we uh, give them a very well balanced set of control regulatory regions that were not frequently mutated. And we asked, do they still contain more mutations than you expect? So yes, you do for single nucleotide variants, also for indels. But interestingly, other types of uh, uh, mutations that occur in cancer genomes, called structural variants, uh, also seem to have more breakpoints in these regions. And finally, some of those regions seem to be locally deleted more often than you would expect from chance. Uh, it tells you something about cancer biology. So there are some tumors that are mutated by single nucleotide variants. Others that are, are more often uh, modified by copy number alterations. And yet others where translocations occur very frequently. So if these regions are indeed important, they would be modified by different genetic mechanisms in different types of tumors. So this is kind of what we see. Um, another aspect to validate our data, uh, we collected more samples from the ICGC database, a much larger set of whole genome sequences, 3,000, uh, and found that uh, those uh, regions in the new data set were also frequently mutated, at least uh, proportionally compared to the number of additional samples that we had, and there was a strong correlation between the mutation rates in the, in the original data set and the validation data set. Now, we can't really do driver discovery, per se, in this new data set, because the new data set is processed in a very messy way. Different people have run different algorithms, so the data sets themselves are not really directly comparable. But it's encouraging to see that the mutation rates are still significant, um, and that there's a good correlation between the new data set and the old data set. Now, why haven't we really found those non-coding uh, candidate driver mutations before? I think this has a lot to do with the data. The non-coding uh, sequence space is very large, and the non-coding uh, mutations tend to be much uh, less frequent. So we conducted a form of power analysis to ask how much data do we need in order to find these types of mutations, and whether we could actually find uh, potential driver mutations in individual cohorts of specific tumor types. So this is a game of numbers. When we have the uh, PCOP and cancer cohort, which has about 1,900 samples, then we're able to detect an effect size of 0.06. So this effect size is sort of an abstract measure, but it shows how infrequent mutations can we still capture. When we look at any of those larger cohorts uh, of individual tumor types of breast, prostate, and pancreas, all of them have about 200 samples in it, then the largest effects that we can detect are uh, 0.2 or 0.18 which means that the mutation has to be three times more frequent in order for us to find it using the same approach. And if you look at median cohort, which I believe is glioblastoma, it only has 41 samples. So it has to be way more frequent in order for us to detect it in our pipeline. So that's why we only find uh, uh, those potential driver mutations by pooling together all the data. But when we can't pool the data, we, we only find almost no results. OK, so when we get back to this picture, then our running hypothesis is that uh, we have these distant regulatory elements. They are mutated in cancer. And the way they uh, conduct their effect on cancer is by regulating faraway genes to these chromatinids. So to get a bit more evidence about that hypothesis, we also found that chromatinid pancreas, or the points where those loops start, they tend to be more frequent in our gene regulatory or pancreas drivers compared to um, like what's expected from the entire genome or what's expected from regulatory regions in general. So that's interesting. A lot of our driver candidates are interacting with far, far away regions, way more than expected from chance. And then the other aspect is, what do those dri uh, driver element candidates actually do? Um, so then we went to the epigenetic growth lab database, where they had uh, profiled gene promoters, gene enhancers, and all other types of regulatory elements in 127 human tissues, so, and, and also some <coughs> slides. And then we asked, well, how many tissues are characteristic of each of one of our <coughs> driver elements? And it turned out that about half of those driver elements seem to be representative of almost all human tissues. So those driver elements seem to be either promoters or enhancers in every characterized human tissue, so they're really a good proxy of a pan cancer data set as well. They, are, they seem to be active in all kinds of tissues. Um, so this, this also tells us what they might be doing. We initially called them super enhancers, but super enhancer is a kind of a vague aspect. It seems to be a pan tissue or multi-tissue enhancer. 
I'll just give you one example and then I have uh, a little bit more time to talk about networks. This is one of our best examples so far. Um, the regulatory element the FMRE is located between genes, but uh, hundreds to, to um, tens to hundreds of uh, kilobases away. Um, the, the potential target gene that we predict is called CCNG191. It interacts with the regulatory element through a chromatin loop. The chromatin loop is is pretty long, so you wouldn't just find that target gene by looking at the genome browser. Um, the regulatory element itself here is um, the background mutation rate in gray, and the dark red shows how many mutations there are in the middle. And then this is uh, the regulatory region, and uh, it shows how many transcription factors are found to be binding that regulatory region. Uh, it's called in literature, these types of regions are called highly occupied targets or hot targets. Um, there's uh, about um, you know, any nucleotide would be bound by 30 different transcription factors. That's about 90 transcription factors in total. So it seems to be a very active uh, gene regulatory element. And then the functional evidence that we have about this element is that uh, here's the distribution of uh, gene expression in all these non-mutated patients. And then the, the patients who have a mutation in this faraway element have much lower gene expression um, in those patients. So this appears to be a known tumor suppressor gene, so it would fit in the hypothesis as well. A tumor suppressor would be downregulated or inhibited the expression because there are certain gene regulatory mutations that would make it happen. Uh, I don't have it here, but it seems that uh, we can validate this in cell lines by removing this uh, enhancer and then observing downregulation of the oncogene. Um, okay, so to go back to the big picture, uh, this is where we uh, laid out the network, so our regulatory elements, along with the potential target genes. Um, the first one, CCNB1, IP1, is in this uh, network module. The interactions show you either long-range chromatin interactions or loops, uh, or potentially if a uh, particular uh, regulatory element is just in the promoter, there's also an interaction. So there are further arrows here indicating genes where we find additional evidence about gene expression association with um, to take a step back, uh, we only found 30 different uh, non-coding driver elements uh, and they are all candidates, so that's not a lot. Why don't, don't we have a lot? Well, one reason is that our data set is not really well powered, but the other aspect is what people call the long tail. So it's all already pretty well recognized that in the protein coding sequence, the cancer driver genes are following a long tail distribution, meaning that there's a small number of very frequent mutations um, on the y-axis. Um, or this is actually a proxy of it, it's a log 10 value. So there's a small number of genes that have, are very significant in terms of their driverness. And then there is a long tail um, of genes where the significant drops pretty dramatically, and many of those long tail genes will be noise, but some of them will be low frequency drivers for which we don't have enough samples, or there's tumor heterogeneity, other types of problems. So there's, there's some key players and a lot of small players. We see the same distribution in non-coding space, uh, but in a very much more dramatic way. Here's Turt, here's a few other candidates, and it drops off really sharply. So the dotted line shows you where you would draw the line if you were testing gene by gene. But maybe gene by gene is not the only op option. And uh, um, for a long time, um, people have approached this problem using pathway and network analysis. So pathway and network analysis is the technique of grouping together similar genes in some sense and seeing if that helps us to get a better picture of what's going on. So in our case, we can analyze groups of genes that have common functions, so maybe gene ontology annotations, or they are involved in same protein protein interaction networks. And uh, to, to even better understand the cancer mutations, we can start to use networks and pathways to integrate coding and non-coding mutations. We know that you know, there's a lot of strong coding mutations, for example, p 3 but that helps us maybe find friends of p 3 that are not as frequently mutated, but nevertheless important. Um, so another aspect why that would be uh, interesting is that we reduce multiple testing. If we test 20,000 genes, we need to be pretty conservative because we just could get an important result by chance. However, if we test only 200 pathways, then we can be more liberal about that multiple testing correction, maybe not uh, downgrade that to such a large extent. So those ideas are embedded in our new tool called Active Pathways. I will show you this really quickly. But the point here is that if you start to integrate pathway and network information in order to uh, predict cancer drivers, 
you will first of all be able to annotate what those drivers are potentially doing by saying that some of them are involved in some cycle, others involved in development, some improvement in modification. But you will also be able to capture some of those genes that are just lurking below the threshold that you wouldn't be finding in a driver gene analysis, but because they have somewhat significant pathways and somewhat significant uh, p values, and they interact with the big guys in the pathway space, then we would be able to capture that. So this is uh, kidney development that has been found uh, as part of the combined coding and non-coding driver analysis. Uh, this is part of the map shown here. We list some of those genes in the kidney development uh, pathway, where the top five are very obviously detected in the gene driver analysis because they're very strong. But right people below the threshold, several interesting genes occur that are also known as cancer driver genes, but they don't have sufficiently many mutations to come out in the, the big screen. So this type of uh, uh, approach helps us to find these additional drivers, but also interpret them all. OK, uh, time for me to summarize. Uh, when we look at pan cancer whole genome sequencing data, we can uh, reveal the rare candidates and non coding drivers in cis regulatory modules, so gene regulatory regions that are often far away from genes. Uh, this is the largest set of such elements described to date, but you know, the caveat is also that we have the largest set of data that could potentially reveal this data set. Um, those regions of interest are in rich chromatin loops uh, and pan tissue super enhancers, for the lack of a better word. Uh, Single but the variants uh, affect distal gene regulation through chromatin looping interactions. We have preliminary evidence that some of those also affect important motifs, uh, such as CDCF motifs, uh, and so on. Uh, the best mutations and candidate mutations we find are associated with target gene expression changes. Some of those are actually occurring in genes that you would expect, and others are novel cancer genes. When you do pathway enrichment analysis of those mutation data, you can further highlight uh, rarely mutate cancer genes, but also get a general picture of what those driver mutations might be about. And then there are these two different tools, active, active driver and active pathways, which help you to analyze cancer genomes, but also the pathway method is pretty general to many other programs as well. Right, um, this is a large group of people. Uh, several people in my lab and, and collaborators' labs um, have been leading parts of this effort. Lisa uh, Usukilarema, the disclaimer, is my wife, but she has been doing a lot of excellent experiments together with Azad. Um, uh, and then people from OICR, and there is a lot of uh, work going in, in the consortium. This is just a tiny piece of the consortium work. Uh, people leading these working groups that we're involved in have provided excellent feedback. We obviously need to uh, thank uh, the patients who provided the data and the consortium who have put together all the, the data set. There's a lot of work going into pre processing these data sets. Um, and then various funding sources as well, including OICR. Uh, this is a snapshot, uh, a recent snapshot of our, of our lab, and there's uh, members who have uh, contributed to the work uh, and then moved on to new positions. We didn't make this picture, unfortunately. Um, and then finally, both of those stories have been wrapped into bioarchive preprints that are available for you to uh, uh, read, and they are currently in revision in several different places. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and welcome any questions. <laughs>